My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. So, a new restaurant opened on the corner just above me this week. It's a charbroiled hamburger place, of course. I went the first day it opened, and it was delicious. It was also expensive. I wondered, seriously, about paying more than 12 bucks for a basic single four-ounce burger not even including fries or a drink. But I told myself, everything is more expensive these days and I obviously want a good hamburger place 30 seconds away from my house to succeed. So I paid. But there is a point at which I wouldn't. 15 bucks for that little tiny patty? Probably not. And now, after recording the discussion you're about to hear today, I will be wondering where that line is at every restaurant I dine in or get takeout from for a while. You might know that restaurants can be a tough business. You almost certainly know that the pandemic hit them hard. But lockdowns are over. Canadians are going back out to eat. And restaurant revenues hit $100 billion last year. A solid increase over the previous one and even an increase from the last pre-pandemic year in 2019. This year, they're supposed to hit $110 billion. So it seems like things should be getting better. No? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Kelly Higginson is the president and the CEO of Restaurants Canada. Hello, Kelly. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. It's good to follow up on the overall health of restaurants, which we did during the pandemic. I was expecting to have better news to talk about today. No kidding. I, I think we all did for sure. So let's start with this then. In a normal pre-pandemic year, what percentage of restaurants in Canada are operating at a loss or underwater? So... Currently, 34% of restaurants are operating a loss as of March 2023, compared with just 7% okay. before the pandemic. And another 17% have reported that they were only breaking even compared with 5% pre-pandemic. Is this all attributable to the pandemic? I would say that it, yes, it is all can be connected back to the pandemic. And it starts really with coming out of the pandemic with carrying high, high levels of debt. Right. And when we're talking about operating at a loss, where has that money gone? Is it missing from sales? Is it because people are still not back eating in restaurants as they were? Like, what are revenues like? I wish we had a simple, easy answer for that because we might be able to find a better solution. But there are so many factors that have led to this situation. As we started to come out of the pandemic, the industry was smacked with high levels of inflation. And right. I, truthfully, I think that they were a bit of a canary in the coal mine here. They started seeing these high levels of increases before I think the average Canadian really started to notice it. And as they were trying to reopen their restaurants, parts, services, food, wages, every single aspect of, of operating a restaurant, whether it was the flatware, anything at all, had dramatically increased. So like double digits. And when we're operating a, a business that already had pretty slim margins, it was very dramatic. And so that was kind of the start of it. And it really hasn't slowed down. We've just seen the inflation continue to increase. On top of that, we have seen the interest rates rise. And when they came out of the pandemic, they all had certain levels of, of loans and debts and maxed out credit cards to try and make it through and keep the business running while we were in this very unique time in history of the pandemic. So now they are paying 
a lot more for that money that they had to to take out as a loan. So mm-hmm. there's there's certainly a few factors there. As far as people still not be eating out, unfortunately, no. Canadians have non-negotiables such as mortgage payments and food and gas and all those other things. And so discretionary spending for dining out starts to get cut back. But although we are now more than a hundred billion dollar annual food sales, once adjusted for menu inflation and population growth, the average Canadian is spending less today on food services than they were in 2019. In 2019, per capita spending on food service adjusted for inflation was $3,010 compared to $2,750 today. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, these, all these small pieces, it sounds like small amounts add up to a lot for an industry that is so large, you know, fourth largest employer in the country. We've also got uh, the issues of, of different day segments. So supper traffic to a full-service restaurant in Q2 in 2023 remains 3% below Q2 in 2019. And lunch traffic is 7% below. And at the same time, guests are cutting back on ordering less expensive entrees or no longer ordering desserts, appetizers, or maybe cutting down on alcoholic beverages. So all of these things really make a, a dramatic impact. But according to the report that you guys released a couple of weeks ago, which is, I should mention, where you're getting these figures from, revenue is rising, right? And and is that because of simply higher prices for menu items? Yes. So when adjusted for anticipated menu inflation of 5.6%, real food service sales are forecasted to grow 4% in 2023 compared to the pre-pandemic sales. So this is still, though, significantly below the pre-pandemic levels. Mm. And it, it really, at the end of the day, it's the bottom line where the challenge is. It's the bottom line is not profitable, whereas the top line, we've seen these, you know, increases in revenues because of all of the costs in between the top and the bottom line. It's not filtering down to profit at the end of the day. I don't want to get people listening to Lost in Numbers, which are uh, kind of hard to deal with um, on a podcast. But but I will ask this, because you mentioned that the cost increases that restaurants have seen are double digits. And I believe you just referred to menu inflation as like 5%. Isn't it typical? And this is something uh, we've sadly learned from covering inflation in many industries over the last little while. You raise the prices to match the rate of inflation, and that's how you stay stable. Oh, yeah. So I think Restaurant operators really are doing their best not to pass down too many of the costs to the consumers because they simply know that the consumer doesn't have it, the discretionary spending in their pocket right now. And because we are seeing people already starting to cut back, as previously mentioned, there is uh, operators are quite nervous of making, you know, decisions that are going to impact their the flow of traffic even more. So where is that line? And I'm, I'm asking you this because I read um, another interview with you and you gave a really uh, interesting example about, I believe it was a blueberry muffin. Blueberry muffin. Yeah, yes. explain explain it to me um, with the cost and, and expenses that go into an item so people can kind of picture it. Sure. I mean, we really are the bottom of the supply chain. We're sort of the, the end of the supply chain. So if we if we take the blueberry muffin that, that seems to have caught a lot of people's attention was, We've got, as we came out of the pandemic, we know that we've got shortages in labor from agricultural workers to truck drivers to warehouse workers all along the supply chain. We have labor increases. We've had labor shortages. We've also had dramatic increases in costs for all of these businesses right across the supply chain. So if the blueberries, to pick the blueberries, cost goes up, that gets passed down to us. And then to get the blueberries to to a supplier that's going to deliver them to a restaurant, that cost goes up. And so all along the way, there's 5%, 10%, 15% here, there, and everywhere. So by the time those blueberries get to us, there's an increase of 25%. Right. So, and, you know, these aren't exact numbers, but some of the increases that we've seen in in items, like a case of avocados going up 50%, so as the blueberry muffin cost continues to increase, so butter's increased, all of the ingredients have increased, then we've seen the increase in labor for the people to make the blueberry muffin. 
That blueberry muffin at the end of the day might actually be if we want to increase it based on inflation in order to bring the same profit down to the bottom line, we may not need to increase that blueberry muffin by 25, 30%. And that's just not realistic. People have, there's a psychological finite amount that people are going to pay for certain items. And I, I hear it all the time. My husband wants strawberries at the grocery store go over a certain amount. Just, that's it. We're not buying strawberries. So it's the same thing with the blueberry muffin. People aren't going to spend $12 for a blueberry muffin, but we might be able to push them to $7. So, so we've got a lot of operators who are quite nervous who really, they're, they're quite gun-shy, to be frank. They've had four years of constant headwinds and volatility. So they're not going to make any more sudden moves. And because of that, um, and because they understand that there is that finite amount for a lot of different items, they're go- not going to be passing on all the costs to the consumer. And when you spoke earlier, you mentioned that, you know, an average restaurant operates on a pretty tight margin. What does that look like? What is a good margin or even just like an acceptable margin for, uh, and let's not use big chain restaurants, just, you know, a, a local restaurant? Sure. I think, you know, in, in the past, it, and it very slim margins in this industry, we are very labor intensive. Um, so that has always impacted the, the margin for the industry. We, we've, generally said between that three to eight to 10 percent at this point for an independent restaurant would be ideal. But the reality is with that 51 percent of losing money that are barely breaking even that I previously spoke about, we're not even seeing that. My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You've mentioned labor a couple of times. How how have those costs impacted restaurants' ability to survive? Because those are some things that I think most people would look at and say are very positive developments to come out of the pandemic. Sure. I mean, there is there's certainly silver linings here. But I think when we see labor and wages increase, I think we also have to keep in mind that everything else has increased as well. So not necessarily convinced that those people are really putting more money in their pocket. So there's there's something to be to consider there with that. Right, but they need that money in order to afford everything that costs more now. Right, but it can it adds to the inflationary costs, right? So in the first 4 months of 2023, wages in the industry grew by 8.4% compared to the same period in 2022, which we all saw significant increases in 2022 as well. This is the largest increase of any major industry and well above the industrial average of 5%. So certainly much higher increases in wages for the food service industry. But given that we are a labor-intensive industry, rising wages and labor shortages disproportionately impact the food service industry compared with other consumer-facing industries. So to break it down, while it takes an average of 3.9 3.9 employees to generate a million dollars in revenue at a retailer grocery store. It takes nearly 13 to generate that in a restaurant. So much more impacted by any increase in wages. What's the solution to that, though? I mean, as you mentioned, you know, there's labor shortage issues uh, all across the board and you need the labor and you need to get it from somewhere. Well, and we want the labor. You know, this is a people business. Mm-hmm. and. You know, we were talking about these these independent operators open these businesses to serve people, to employ people, to be a part of the community. So that's always a really important thing that I think sometimes as we get caught up in a lot of the numbers, if we think of the impact on a community of losing one or two, if it takes some of these smaller communities and, that are spread coast to coast to coast, losing one or two of their restaurants is very impactful to the community. But as far as solutions go, 
that's where our food service facts report talks about some of the automation and tech, you know, options out there now that that could help with some of these. And I think we've seen a lot of of automation and um, certainly some some tech upgrades in in restaurants in the last couple of years. But going back to the fact that they're not really making a profit, it's really hard for operators right now to find money to reinvest into their businesses in order to come up with these solutions because it's expensive. Well, that's what I was going to say. And it ends up, I assume, being the big chain restaurants that can afford to automate and lower their labor costs. And then their margins go up while everybody else struggles to be able to implement any changes. Yeah, I think, you know, I will say, I think it's being felt across the board in all areas of food service industry. So there's, you know, while I think some some operators have an easier time of it than others. There's still a lot of debt that has been built up throughout the pandemic. And if you're a big operation, it just means that it needs to be that much more of an investment. So what are those local owners doing um, to stay afloat given the situation? Do you have any idea of some creative solutions, systemic solutions, anything out there that you see happening that offers a, a way to profitability? Yeah, I think, you know, we are seeing a lot of menu changes, which has been helpful. So things that aren't as labor intensive in the kitchens is certainly helpful. I think coming up with uh, recipes that are a little bit easier for a greener workforce as well, because that's another piece of this. We had to reopen after two years of constant lockdowns, which was challenging for our workforce. So we lost a few of those. Um, so they're they're tweaking just how intensive a lot of the steps of service are from the kitchen all the way to the front of the house. And I, you know, I have to say I'm so in awe of what I've seen these operators m- get moved through over the last three and four years. And I, I was in the industry as we were reopening, running a business that had five large restaurants. Uh, in three different provinces. So it was interesting to see that from the different regulations and we were opening at different times. But to see the restaurants come back to life again certainly was a really awe-inspiring experience. So I think we're seeing, you know, a lot of changes from menus. We're seeing a lot of changes in in different ways of service. We've seen some of the more casual full-service restaurants move to more of a counter-style service where you go to the counter and order, but they'll deliver the food to your table. Right. So some of the things that are just cutting out some of the steps. And, you know, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of operators move over to online ordering platforms and such. And thankfully, they were, they were able to, to figure out how to do that. So that always helps as well. You mentioned a high level of debt uh, taken on during the pandemic. I know I know during those measures, there was a lot of government support for restaurants. I assume those programs have pretty much all ended. What is available now, if anything? The federal government provided uh, the SEBA loan to small businesses, and this really was a lifeline and one of the, the many, and we're grateful for the supports that were received for sure. But Unfortunately, the deadline to repay the forgivable portion of the loan has only been extended by 18 days, which, you know, simply is just not enough or realistic for restaurants and given the volatility that they've been having to manage. So, you know, restaurants aren't looking for a handout, but what we are calling for is more time given all of the extenuating circumstances since we started to try and reopen our, our businesses. So they, we want more time and we want another year to try and find that stability and predictability for the businesses. I will say the bigger concern right now for me, and it's really, really weighing on me, is a lot of these independent operators are turning to third-party lenders that are giving them a loan to pay off the forgivable portion at a higher interest rates. And it's just continually to, to pile on for them. I mean, when they took these loans out, they had no idea that just the lockdown period itself was going to be as long as it was and that lack of stability. But then to on top of that, we've just been hit with so many headwinds. So there isn't a lot. We have, you know, given the government some, some great solutions and for our pre-budget requests, we've presented some solutions to the government to lower the cost burden for operators that we really do need to see implemented. We need to protect our small and medium-sized businesses in these countries. And as I said, this industry is the fourth largest 
employer, private employer in the country, and it's a hundred billion dollar industry. So we've got some requests in to lower the small business tax from nine to eight percent, to cap the federal excise tax on alcohol at two percent, to maintain that freeze from last year instead of a potential increase of four percent, and make business expense meals fully deductible to try and stimulate some of that lunch business back. Uh, we're currently investigating all areas in taxes and rebates for the industry and have a few studies being done along with, of course, that extension for the SIBA loans for at least a year. And I guess we'll see uh, when the budget hits what's included in there. While these restaurants are barely hanging on or operating at a loss, is that translating into raw numbers of closures versus openings? Are we losing restaurants in this country? And if so, what kind of rate are we doing that at? What's that look like? The short and simple answer is we absolutely are. And we have communicated this to the government. Um, so for, for a number of years, we were kind of sitting at a one opening, one closing rate. and that changed two closings for every one opening about six months ago. We've also got a 55% increase in bankruptcies in the first eight months of the year, which is the highest of any industry. So, I, you know, this, these, are, these are very concerning numbers. The reality is, is that we do quarterly outlook surveys to get a pulse of the industry and see where things are at. And in the last year and a half, things have not gotten better at any point, which as I think as we started this podcast and this conversation, I think both you and I thought at some point things were going to get better than they were two and a half years ago. They are not and they are clearly getting worse. What's the one thing that you want people listening to this to take away and understand about the industry that maybe they don't right now, but also just do? Well, I think it's really important for us to consider what having restaurants in our community means. That, you know, get, again, going back to that important part of the community and socializing and what we want our main streets to look like. So that, that's important. I think it's also important for people to remember that all of the challenges from a cost perspective that the average Canadian is managing right now, the industry is managing and has been managing for quite some time, along with all of the other issues that have come up with operating a business. So I know that we've asked Canadians to be patient as we were reopening because we were retraining, you know, all of our employees and getting used to a new reality. I understand that some people may see the sticker shock of the menu prices, but I think if we can just step back and think about first what these restaurants mean to us on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Jordan Heath-Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy, as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency.